Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Last week, we talked about the reign of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, who had made a marriage alliance with King Ahab of Israel. And at Jehoshaphat's death, King Jerome, the son-in-law of Ahab and Jezebel, ascended unto the throne of his father, and he reigned in Judah. This was when the alliance of Judah and Israel bore disastrous fruits. For Joram walked in the ways of the king of Israel, not the kings of Judah, as the house of Ahab had done, not the house of David. And he did it, says 2 Chronicles chapter 22, verse, verse 6, for the daughter of Ahab, who was his wife. Mama, don't let your babies grow up and marry horrible women. Jehoram's first act as king was to murder his six brothers so that there would be no rivals for the throne. He was a horrible, horrible man. Jehoram uh, only reigned for eight years, some of which was the neighboring nations revolted against them. Judah went whoring after other gods, and he died in agony, and he departed and no one regretted his loss. After Jehoram, Ahazai, the youngest son, reigned for a year before Jehoram's wife, Athelia, rose up and destroyed all of the royal family of the house of Judah. She basically purged the nation of Judah for anybody who was even distantly related to the house of David and Solomon. And this was up to seven and eight generations. We're seven to eight generations away from the reign of David and Solomon. Just to put this into scope, seven or eight generations away from us in America puts us back to the Revolutionary War. Could you imagine a queen mother from Canada coming to power in America and then murdering and killing fourth and fifth and sixth distant cousins to people who had at some point had any sort of a distant relationship to George Washington. This woman was as wicked as her mother Jezebel, and if it could be possible, more ambitious and even more bloodthirsty. Throughout this whole time, the temple of the Lord God, which is in Jerusalem, a stone's throw away from the palace, lays in basic ruins. It has been plundered, it has been desecrated, and it has been largely ignored. And throughout all of Second Chronicles, we see that the state of the temple is a representative of the state of the people. Because when the king is far from God, the people are also far from God. Of Aziel's sons, only one Joash was rescued, secreted away by his aunt and uncle and spared. Queen Athelia's reign of evil lasted six years while Joash was stashed, stashed in the temple. What a great place to hide the king of God because that was the last place Athelia ever cared to look for anything was in the temple. Joash was declared king at seven years of age when Athelia was executed. Joash was brought out by his uncle, Jehoiada. It's good to have another pastor because I had no idea what to do with all of those vowels. Good job, chaplain. I'll try to say that too, by the way. Jehoiada had raised him. As it was written, Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada, the priest, which is an odd phrase. It shows us the difficulty that's going to happen because the king does what is right up until a point. And then he just stops. But before he stops doing that which is right, he, he commences in a major renovation. He commences in a major renovation and a cleaning of the temple. He restores it unto his purpose. He restores the burnt offerings on a daily basis. It took a long time, but Joash was zealous for the project and zealous for the Lord, and he made sure that it was complete. And throughout all the days of Jehoiada, the priest, the worship was restored. 
And when Jehoiada died, new counselors arose to pay homage unto the king. And they led him to abandon the house of the Lord, to serve the Asherahs and the foreign gods that had been brought into the land again. The building that he had spent so much time renovating and cleaning and restoring. The temple that his great-great-great-great-grandfather had built. The temple that his great-great-great-great-grandfather had bought the land for David and Solomon that had been handed down to him is forsaken again. Joash proved to be a weak king after all, and the wrath of God fell upon Judah again. God sent prophets, but Joash paid no attention unto them. The prophets were rejected. God's appeal was turned away again and again. And finally, Jehoiada's son, the priest, Zechariah, came to appeal to his cousin personally. Zechariah was a cousin not only to Joash, but he was like a brother. The two were raised in the same household. Because he was the son of Joash's adopted father, surely if anyone, if anyone could break through to Joash the king, surely it would be his priestly adoptive brother Zechariah. We read from scripture that the spirit of God had clothed Zechariah as he goes to prophesy unto his, his almost brother. He says, why do you break the commandments of the Lord so that he cannot prosper? For Zechariah's troubles, Joash conspired with the princes of the land against him. And as God's prophet and priest stood in the courtyard in the very temple that Joash had restored, they stoned him to death right there in the middle of the temple courthouse, courtyard. As he was dying, Zechariah cried out, May the Lord see and avenge, which recalls the blood of Abel that cried out from the ground when he was killed by his brother. The temple was a beautiful building. A beautiful building. The temple of Solomon was one of the grandest of buildings of its age. But divorced from the, the steadfast faith, that's all it was. Just a big, pretty building. Kings are often famous for their building projects. The Egyptians built the great pyramids. Nebuchadnezzar had the hanging gardens of Babylon. Eisenhower created an interstate system. It still bears his name today and may for a thousand years. Great examples of projects brought through lasting time and, and pulled through the name of their sponsors. Great buildings captivate our attention. And on Holy Week, even Jesus' disciples comment on the temple as they're leaving one, one evening. They look at Jesus and they look at all of the stones and the big building. What a wonderful, wonderful house of God we have. Jesus was unimpressed. He foretold the destruction of that temple. Whatever pride Joash had in the temple was in vain when he rejected the word of God. Solomon's temple, which Joash spent so much time and money and energy for, was destined for destruction. And many, many years later, after Joash died, Nebuchadnezzar would overrule, would overrun Jerusalem and raise the temple himself. It was later rebuilt on a significantly smaller scale during the time of Ezra in Nehemiah. It would be expanded later on by that wily Idiomean king Herod. That temple was later destroyed as well in 70 AD by the Romans, and it remains in ruins unto this day. The Ishmaelites, the cousins of the Israelites, have built the dome on the rock upon it and say it shall not be taken down. Kings indeed build impressive buildings. And sometimes kings destroy impressive buildings. And even the kings who built and cleansed the temples can be led astray. They turn away from God whose presence dwelt in the temple. And often they turn away from the Lord God himself. They often turn away of the purpose of the building itself. If their focus is on the building, then their eyes tend to, to not be fixed on God. We need a better king. We need a better king who can build and restore a temple. A temple that will never fall into disrepair. We need a Messiah who will save his people from their sins. We need Jesus, the son of Joash. It's interesting 
how this story ties into the Messianic prophecies. You see that Jesus was also found in the temple as an infant. And people with the eyes of God saw him. Simeon, Anna, recognized the Lord God in an infant form. He also had an uncle, Zechariah, by the way, who was also a priest. Jesus' life was threatened by that same King Herod who had expanded the temple. Jesus was hidden away by his adopted father, Joseph. As a young man, Jesus was always about his father's work perfectly, absolutely at home in his father's house. In fact, the zeal for his father's house consumed him. And that son of Joash would cleanse the temple many generations later, overwhelming the money changers, flipping their, their tables and setting the, the animals free. This, my, my house, my father's house will be a house of prayer and you've turned it into a den of thieves. But our King David, our King David is more than that. His body is the temple. John the Baptist witnessed it. John the Baptist saw it at, at Jesus' baptism. He saw, he saw the Spirit of God descend upon him like a dove. And then that same Spirit remained upon Jesus. Just as the glory of the Lord God had filled the tabernacle generations before, just as the Holy Spirit had clothed the, the Zechariah, the priest, the Holy Spirit made Jesus his temple, made Jesus' body his temple. And the prophets were sent to prepare Judah for the coming of the Messiah. And just as the Judeans rejected the prophets in the days of old, so the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected John the Baptist's testimony. And then they rejected God's Son himself. They already had a king. They said they didn't need another. But we do. Jesus said, woe to you. Woe to you who build the tombs of the prophets of whom your fathers had killed. And so you are witnesses and you consented to the deeds of your father for they killed them, but you built their tombs. Therefore, the wisdom of God continues to say, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. Luke chapter 11, verse 47 and 51. When the Judeans sent their king, the son of David, to death, he became a mediator of a new covenant. Thanks be unto God that the sprinkled blood speaks a better word than that blood spilt of Zechariah. Jesus did not cry out of the cross from vengeance, but he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Because Jesus' blood still speaks forgiveness. Jesus' spilt blood still speaks of peace. It's a blood that washes away the sins of humanity. And he is the true drink of life. We need a king. We need a better king. We need a king who can provide a temple that will survive. We need a king that can, serve, that can provide a temple that's not subject to to the vulgarities of politics. We need a temple which is beyond the reach of princes and beyond the reach of sinful people. We need a temple that cannot be destroyed with human hands. We need a, a way that we can come into his presence with thanksgiving and know that we're being received. And Jesus has made that promise on time. Where two or three are gathered and we call upon the name of God, we are in that temple. Our King, our Lord Jesus, bore that temple in his body. And though that body was destroyed, he did not see corruption. He was resurrected. That temple, as he said it would, is rebuilt, reconstituted in a mere three days. And that temple will never be destroyed. And that temple will never be desecrated because it is eternally clean. And it will continue to be a refuge for sinners who look to it. The body and blood of God. The pledge of of a new covenant, and we have an eternal temple for which we yearn, to which we are all headed. And in him, we worship in that same spiritual temple in purity and truth. And in him, we have eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.